This is episode 7 of Amos chapter 5. So here's Amos over here, preaching to the northern kingdom before they go into Assyrian captivity. Amos was active 760 to 753 BC, just seven years in total. He preached during the reign of King Uzziah of Judah, who is over here, who reigned for 52 years, and Jeroboam the second of Israel over here, yeah, who reigned for 41 years. And the reigns of the two kings overlapped about 15 years. The north and south were at the zenith of their power. They both experienced national stability, prosperity, and the expansion of their kingdoms. Here you can read a recap of chapter 1, where Israel's enemies are judged, and a recap of chapter 1b, where Israel's cousins, their bloodline, are judged. And then I added a little bit of the first piece of chapter 2 into this. So you can pause and read this, or we can just continue. So this is a recap of chapter 2, the judgment on Judah and Israel themselves. Chapter 3, the prophet's authority to Israel, where he tells them what's going to happen because of their sins. And you can pause and read this. Or you can do chapter 4, because we're now on chapter 5. This is a recap of chapter 4. Prepare to meet your God. And you can pause and read this, or we'll just carry on. So the layout of Amos illustrates his key idea, judgment comes. So we had judgment on Israel's neighbors, their enemies, judgment on God's people, Judah and Israel themselves, Israel's present, which was uh, the, Amos pointing out the punishment for their sin, Israel's past, where God says he's tried already to punish them and yet they haven't returned to him. And now we're in chapter 5, which is Israel's future, and chapter 6 will be Israel's future. So we're on a lament for Israel. The third sermon, chapters 5 and 6. So note, Amos 5 is a really long chapter. In fact, it's the longest chapter I've put together in one piece. I've, if they've been long before and I could split them logically, then I did. But there wasn't any way to split this logically, I didn't think. So this is my longest chapter, but Amos 6 is a very short chapter. So what you lose here, you're going to gain there in time. So please bear with me. So let's start, dive into chapter 5, A Lament for Israel. Verse 1, hear this word which I take up against you, O lamentation, O house of Israel. Hear this word. Amos starts with this phrase in chapters 3 and 4 and 5. Amos had tears in his eyes. Please listen to me. This is important. Deep sorrow is about to befall your nation. A lamentation, O house of Israel. A lamentation is a song of mourning. Amos laments as if Israel is already dead. In fact, the first 17 verses are funeral dirge sung over the corpse of Israel. From Israel's point of view, life is terrific. They're at the zenith of their power and prosperity. The rich enjoyed an indulgent lifestyle with their summer and winter homes, but the poor were exploited and used as cheap labor. Judges could be bribed to find in favor of the rich, and slavery was condoned to pay off usually non-existent paltry debts. From God's point of view, Israel's morality was abysmal. They were dissolute pagans with no redeeming qualities. Verse 2. The virgin of Israel is fallen. She will rise no more. She lies forsaken on her land. There is no one to raise her up. The virgin of Israel is fallen. Biblically speaking, a virgin is a young unmarried maiden living in her father's house. However, this maiden will have her expected destiny prematurely cut off. Has fallen is Old Testament shorthand for fallen in battle. Israel will fall in a humiliating defeat while trying to defend their own land. Israel's purity has been stripped away. Her paganism was spiritual harlotry. She's a fallen woman, seen as an abandoned dead body tossed in an open field. Jeremiah 9, this is what the Lord declares. Dead bodies will lie like dung on the open field, like cut grain behind the reaper, with no one to gather them. She will rise no more. She will rise no more. Israel stands alone to face the horror of the Assyrian Empire. There is no other nation powerful enough that can come to her aid. She lies forsaken on her land. She lies forsaken on her land. Israel's mighty army could not withstand the Assyrian onslaught. She fell in 722 BC and was forcibly removed from her land and exiled to foreign lands. 
There's no one to raise her up. Israel has no one to turn to her for help except God. But we know from chapter 4 that no matter how many times God asks them to repent, yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. Verse 3. For thus says the Lord God, The city that goes out by a thousand shall have a hundred left, and that which goes out by a hundred shall have ten left to the house of Israel. So cities with a high concentration of people are the easiest to overrun and control. Israel will be decimated from a thousand people to a hundred to ten, meaning cities and villages of different sizes, some large, some small, will all fall. Human loss will be in the 90% range. Yet everything that God is doing to Israel is based upon their non-performance of the law of Moses that they sought to uphold. Deuteronomy 28, you shall be left few in number, whereas you were as the stars of heaven in multitude, because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God. A call to repentance. Verse 4, for thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, seek me and live. There's still a ray of hope, even at this late hour, but their salvation is conditional. They have to repent and seek a righteous walk with God. Then only will the north escape their violent end, anticipated in Amos' lament. James 1 says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. But does Israel repent? No. So will Israel be saved? No. Verse 5. But do not seek Bethel, nor enter Gilgal, nor pass over to Beersheba, for Gilgal shall surely go into captivity, and Bethel shall come to nothing. Do not seek Bethel. Bethel means the house of God, and was an early place where the Hebrews encountered God, built altars there, and commemorated him. Bethel is mentioned in over 60 verses in the Bible. It was steeped in holiness. Bethel had rivaled Jerusalem, the most prominent city of the religious, cultural, and political life of the Israelites. But not anymore. With their unholy temple and golden calf, Bethel had become the hold of demons, where sacrifices were made to idols and ritual prostitution was practiced. Many Old Testament prophets railed against the city, Jeremiah, Hosea, and here in Amos, in chapters 3 and 4 and 5. All shrines where the worship of false gods took place would be destroyed. In fact, the Assyrians appreciated the value of the gold in the golden calf and gleefully carried them off. So Amos says, don't seek Bethel, don't bother the pilgrimage, because Bethel will come to nothing. Nor enter Gilgal. Gilgal means rolling away, as God rolled away all the things that were oppressing his people when they crossed over into the promised land. Here the men were circumcised as a commitment to living according to God's laws. Gilgal had been a sacred place where they raised a holy altar to God, made of the twelve stones picked up in the river Jordan, and made sacrifices there. Bulls were a worthy sacrifice, and the most expensive gift to God. The altar and the priests were also sanctified by smearing the blood of the bull upon the altar's horns. Thus the altar was not only set apart for sacred use, but made so holy as to sanctify the gifts that were offered upon it. Gilgal played a pivotal role in the nation's spiritual journey. It became the site of the school for prophets associated with Elijah and Elisha. But now Amos warns people away from Gilgal. The city had rejected Yahweh and devolved into a hotbed of idolatry, shame, guilt, and spiritual failure. And Gilgal was where they camped, and the first city they attacked in the promised land was Jericho. Nor pass over to Beersheba. Beersheba means the well of the treaty where King Abimelech gave a disputed well back to Abraham. This was a dry, barren region, so wells were priceless. The city marked the southernmost border with Dan the northernmost point, so the Bible talks from Dan to Beersheba nine times to designate King David's entire United Kingdom. The distance from Dan to Beersheba was approximately 270 miles. So here's Beersheba and here's the Negev Desert. And here's Dan up here in the very north. Dan was originally given this land by Joshua, but then the Philistines, these giants over here, kept raiding them. So eventually they just moved up north and took all their good stuff and their skills with them and moved. So when the Bible says Dan to Bathsheba, it was uh, to denote the entire uh, north Israel and southern Israel. 
So Bathsheba was the place where several people in the Bible came into contact with God. Here God made a promise to Hagar and her son Ishmael, who became the, the Arab nations today, as she wandered about after Sarah kicked her out of Abraham's camp. And Abraham's son Isaac built an altar there. And Elijah, running for his life from Jezebel, encountered an angel there that fed him. Wouldn't that be cool to be fed by an angel? Yet by the time of Amos, Beersheba had become a center of idol worship. And the prophet warns those who are true worshippers of God, do not make a pilgrimage to the idols there. All three locations, Bethel, Gilgal, and Beersheba, had been co-opted and now represented rebellion to God's word and disobedience to his laws. Amos warns that seeking God's sanctuary is not the same as seeking God the Father. That's like attending church without really meeting God there. Verse 6. Seek the Lord and live, lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph, and devour it with no one to quench it in Bethel. Seek the Lord and live. Empires rise and fall at God's command. Leaders live and die at God's command. Gilgal and Bethel were both places where something good had happened to Israel in the past. But now God warns, seek me, change your ways. There's still hope, if not for the nation, at least for individuals. The house of Joseph. When Joseph was second in command in Egypt and storing grain during, during the seven years of plenty, he married an Egyptian princess and had two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. They were the two tribes of Israel from the house of Joseph, and both were allotted a land portion in the promised land. The Bible denotes Ephraim as the house of Joseph or the northern kingdom or Israel or Jacob. All of those words are used in the Bible. Obadiah uses both names in his prophecy about Edom. Abadiah 18, Jacob will be a fire and Joseph a flame and Esau will be stubble. And devour it with no one to quench it in Bethel. Bethel had become the main religious center of the apostate northern kingdom. Amos says that the God, with a little g, that the Israelites worshipped there would be powerless to save the place when the one true God brought his judgment. Now, verses 7 to 9 are considered by scholars to be the best of inspired poetry. They give the reasons for God's punishment. Verse 7, you who turn justice to wormwood and lay righteousness to rest in the earth. Turn justice to wormwood. Wormwood is a bitter tasting, poisonous root. The north had turned justice and the courts into the bitter pill of injustice. God is a God of perfect order, yet the north had turned the kingdom into bitter chaos. Deuteronomy 29, make sure there is no man or woman, clan or tribe among you today whose heart turns away from the Lord our God to go and worship the gods of those nations. Make sure there is no root among you that produces such bitter poison. Verse 7. Verse 8. He made the Pleiades and Orion. He turns the shadow of death into morning and makes the day dark as night. He calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. So verse 8 is regarded as a fragment of an ancient hymn to Jehovah from before the time of Job. And Amos seems to have known it and inserted it here. Amos may even have sung this portion of his message to his audience. He made the Pleiades and Orion. So here in the stars, this is Orion, Orion's melt in the Pleiades. Who made them? The God of creation. The God who made the cosmos and set the signs in the skies. The Pleiades and Orion have been used for millennia to indicate the summer and winter seasons. Now the Pleiades are the seven stars of the constellation Taurus, the bull, and are always mentioned in connection with Orion. In Job 9, he's the maker of the bear and Orion, the Pleiades and the constellations of the south. Job 38, God speaking to Job says, Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades? Can you loosen Orion's belt? So today we know that the stars of the Pleiades and Orion are hooked together by electrically charged particles, the plasma of space. Plasma is the word given to the fourth state of matter. So we have solid, liquid, gas, plasma. For example, water is ice or water or steam. And we also have now plasma. Yet thousands of years ago, in the book of Job talks of these things being chained together. And I was looking uh, on, on the website we see Orion and they draw the picture and, you know, his bow. And this is actually what it looks like. <laughs> so 
unless I draw the little picture for you of the Pleiades, it, <laughs> that's what it really looks like. Amos verse 7 said, You who turn good things into bad is contrasted now with the God of creation. He turns the night into morning and governs the order of the universe. If God wants to, he can stop the sun shining in the morning. Psalm 19, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. He calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out in the face of the earth. God regulates the seas and rainfall. In the water cycle of life, the sea evaporates into clouds, the clouds pour out rain, the streams gather the water, and rivers flow back to the sea. Nothing is wasted in God's creation. Isn't that marvelous? The Lord is his name. There is no other. Verse 9. He rains ruin upon the strong, so that fury comes upon the fortress. He rains ruin. Amos uses the cycle of water as a metaphor for God's anger, raining down on the people because of the breakdown of law and order. God rains ruin upon them. Fury comes upon the fortress. Their fortifications, their high walls of which they're so proud, are nothing when God decides to smash them down. The Lord himself will apply the justice that is lacking in their society. Verse 10. They hate the one who rebukes in the gate, and they abhor the one who speaks uprightly. In ancient times, the king and the leaders of the community sat in the gate of the city and acted as judge for any disputes. It was a public place where everyone could see and hear the proceedings, and the leaders' decisions were final. But now the law has been corrupted by the greedy. There is no justice. From a biblical perspective, fact and truth are quite different. Truth expresses God's moral code. Therefore, anything that disagrees with God's moral code cannot be truth. Fact typically has no moral element to it. Fact is the existence of something within our physical world. For example, it's a fact that there's only two unique sexes, male and female. Now, facts can change as knowledge increases because there's no morality to it. Is the earth flat or round? Is it flat, as the Bible states, or round, as NASA claims? By the way, Strong's Hebrew lexicon translates to deceive as NASA. To deceive. Truth is never wrong and it never changes. Injustice is not justice, regardless of how the leaders try to spin it. The North's justice is not being administered with morality, with truth. So now Amos sits as judge in their gates, publicly rebuking them, and the corrupt leaders hate him. Hate the one who rebukes in the gate. <laughs> they abhor the one who speaks uprightly. The leaders have an active dislike for Amos's prophetic authority. They don't want to hear any condemnation of their behavior. They don't want to be disciplined. They are living deliciously, as Revelation puts it. Yet now Amos was publicly pointing out all their sins. And Amos wasn't even local. He came from Judah, the southern kingdom. But Amos wasn't running in a popularity contest. He wanted the people to avert their coming judgment by turning away from idolatry, immorality, and injustice and turn back to God. Verse 11. Therefore, because you tread down the poor and take grain taxes from him, though you have built houses of hewn stone, yet you shall not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink wine from them. Therefore, as David Parson always says, when you see therefore, you should wonder what it's there for. Therefore, why is it there? Because a consequence is about to be announced. You tread down the poor. The rich with the advantage of money and power and cronyism trampled on the poor. Take grain taxes from him. The land was inherited from generation to generation and was not to be sold. Yet some were forced to sell through circumstances. However, every seven years they could reclaim or redeem their land through the Jubilee. Meanwhile, the landowners were not entitled to tax the produce, which was really a tax on their labor. Yet the rich were forcing the poor into the status of tenant farmers by taxing their crops. Houses. So he says, um, you have built houses of hewn stone, yet you shall not dwell in them. Thus, Therefore, in other words, as a consequence of their wickedness, Amos says God would take away their prized possessions, their gorgeous homes and pleasant vineyards that they built on the backs of the poor. 
Amos warns that they won't get to enjoy their ill-gotten gains. Their prosperity is only temporary. Deuteronomy 28. However, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all his commands and decrees I am giving you today, all these curses will come on you and overtake you. Deuteronomy 28, a few verses later. You will build a house, but you will not live in it. You will plant a vineyard, but you will not even begin to enjoy its fruit. Just as they got rich at the expense of others, so the Assyrians will get rich at their expense. Their rich lifestyles would end abruptly when the Assyrians confiscate their treasures and drag them off into captivity with a hook through their noses. Verse 12. For I know your manifold transgressions and your mighty sins, afflicting the just and taking bribes, diverting the poor from justice at the gate. For I know your transgressions. God is totally aware of their violations of his morality code. Diverting the poor from justice. The greedy leaders of the city, sitting at the gates as judges, were utterly corrupt. God sees that they find in favor of the rich against the poor, who are innocent of the alleged crimes. Afflicting the just and taking bribes. And even the accredited judges were bribed. They were meant to dispense justice. Instead, they perverted it. The poor and needy had no recourse to a fair and just outcome. Even today, if you can afford an expensive criminal lawyer, he can talk circles around your free legal aid lawyer and twist the courts in his client's favor. Or the rich can bribe witnesses, the jurors, or even the judge. You know the golden rule? The man with the gold makes the rules. That's what the rich live by. Verse 13. Therefore the prudent keep silent at that time, for it is an evil time. Scholars think a later editor accidentally dropped this verse in here from another spot because it seems to interrupt the flow of the passage. But in ancient times, being a scribe was such an honored position that even tiny mistakes were not tolerated. So I'm not sure about that. The prudent keep silent. Amos is not condoning the silence, the failure to speak out. He's simply stating a fact. It's better to keep your mouth shut and your head down than gain the attention of the wicked. Even Amos himself faced the fury of the leaders and fake priests as he went around prophesying their coming doom. Amos 7, we're in Amos 5 right now. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent a message to Jeroboam, king of Israel. Amos is raising conspiracy against you in the very heart of Israel. The land cannot bear all his words. The threat that Amos faced was so real that some thought he had been murdered. And while he may have avoided bodily assassination, the fake priests assassinated his character with their lies. For it is an evil time. Basically, society had collapsed. The prudent man knows he alone cannot change the state of affairs of the North, but can only await judgment. Or run. But his options are limited because it's an evil time and even Judah in the south is corrupt and apostate. So God is done telling Israel what not to do. Now he's telling them what to do in order to be saved. So it's like sunlight breaking through the gloom. Amos has three appeals. In verse 4 he said, seek me and live. Verse 6, seek the Lord and live. And here in verse 14, which is coming up next, seek good, not evil, that you may live. Seek God and good and live. Why? Because God is a good God. This is the message of Amos. You cannot find God unless you are ready to find good. In Matthew 6, Jesus said, So do not worry saying, What shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. So verse 14, see good and not evil, that you may live, so the Lord God of hosts will be with you as you have spoken. So far Amos' message has been a lament for the death of the nation, but there is a conditional ray of light, repent. The path to change is explicit, seek good, live a moral, ethical, righteous life. Amos' message is urgent and more pressing, turn from your wicked ways. Act like leaders are supposed to act. Take care of the poor, the needy, the widows, and the orphans. Isaiah 1. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. That you may live. 
God be with you. So it's that, that you may live with you, so the Lord God of hosts will be with you as you have spoken. You, you, you. You have to change as individuals so that you change as a nation, as you have spoken. God reminds Israel that they say they claim to be God's chosen. So act like it. Verse 15. Hate evil, love good. Establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord of hosts will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Hate evil, love good. God gives his people conscious, tangible, moral choices to make. To hate evil means to shun what God calls evil. To love good means to embrace what God calls good. And we all intuitively know what good and evil is. It may be that the Lord will be gracious. Amos can't guarantee that at this late stage that the Lord will stay his judgment. But perhaps God will be merciful, but don't presume on his grace. Yet we know that God will always respond to true repentance. Hundreds of years later, John assures us that we can count on God's faithfulness. 1 John 1, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Establish justice in the gate. Prove that you have a change of heart. When you sit in the city gates, judging disputes, rule in favor of the aggrieved without bias. And do this going forward. Let the test of time prove you have a genuine change of behavior. Be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. The name Joseph itself implies the possibility of salvation of the nation. Remember, Joseph saved everybody in the seven years of drought. The remnant of Joseph are repentant Israel, those who return to a covenant relationship with a holy God, who seek good, not evil. The day of the Lord. Amos returns to his lament. So verses 16 and 17 are a call to Israel to mourn, because God's wrath means destruction and death, and every level of society will suffer. Verse 16. Therefore the Lord God of hosts, the Lord, says this, there shall be wailing in all streets, and they shall say in all the highways, Alas, alas, they shall call the farmer to mourning, and skillful lamenters to wailing. So all will be affected by God's judgment. Everyone, even the busy farmers, would join in the lamentations of the professional mourners as weeping moves from the farms to the city streets. They shall be wailing in all streets. Amos has been crying all this time as he laments the sad future of the nation. Jeremiah also cried when he saw the future coming up when he was warning. Jeremiah sobbed all the time. That's why you have the book of Lamentations. It was, it was Jer Jeremiah sobbing at the thought of the future. So far, Amos has been the only one crying, but soon the entire nation will weep. Judgment is coming, from which there's no appeal. The small window of opportunity for repentance is shutting. Punishment will be inescapable. Skillful lamenters to wailing. Back in the day, you could hire professional mourners that would come to your funeral and wail mightily for as long as they were paid. Today, social media influencers will howl and decry whatever is culturally tending as long as they are paid. Verse 17. In all vineyards there shall be wailing, for I will pass through you, says the Lord. All vineyards. Vineyards were a place of joy, but not for much longer there will be wailing. For I will pass through you. When God last passed through in Egypt, the firstborn of everyone, even all animals, died. Exodus 12. On that same night I will pass through Egypt and shut down every firstborn of both people and animals. And I will bring judgment on all of the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. This is a terrifying prophecy over the northern kingdom. In fact, the babies and children would likely not survive the 1,800-mile hike to Assyria. They would die from lack of food and water and the pure arduousness of the journey, 1,800 miles. God reminds Israel that he redeemed them from bondage in Egypt. He will redeem them from the bondage in Assyria, and he will redeem us today from the bondage of sin if we repent and come into covenant with him. So if you repent and come into government, you get blessed with wonderful vineyards. Otherwise, not so blessed. Now Amos goes from wailing to woeing. God utterly rejects their false religion. Israel is relying on the fact that they are God's chosen and conveniently forget that they are not following God's commandments, nor his precepts, nor his statutes, nor his laws. 
None of them. God loathed their version of religion. So why would they think they still hold that privileged position of chosen? They don't. They are deceiving themselves. And Amos sets them straight. They have no basis upon which to come to God because their conduct clearly violates his laws. And in over 2,700 years, God has not changed. He judges us the same today as he judged Israel then. Seek good, not evil, or things will not go well with you. Verse 18. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. For what good is the day of the Lord to you? It will be darkness and not light. Woe to you. Woe, not to the pagan nations, but to Israel. A woe is a curse. When Jesus said woe to you, cities were obliterated. They were wiped off the face of the earth. And now the north faces that same fate. God has moved from their protector to their adversary. The day of the Lord. This is an extended time of judgment. It's not just 24 hours. This is not the rapture. This is the great tribulation. And no one desires that day. The prophet Joel was the first to speak of the day of the Lord when he compared the future great tribulation to the devastating locust plague that had devoured every green thing and caused massive famine and untold death. And Amos uses this same phrase to warn Israel in no uncertain terms that they too would all die. You who desire the day of the Lord. They look forward to that day. They thought God would punish all their enemies, but they were untouchable. Yet they don't realize that God had already lifted his hand of blessing away from them. Israel longed for the day of the Lord, because as his chosen, they expected to be exalted, shown to all the world that they were his. They thought their prosperity was a sign they had favor with God, that he accepted their rituals and worship. After all, they were blessed. But their religious life was all wrong, and there were consequences for that. Amos warns that the day of the Lord will come, but not as Israel expects. Pop in their balloon. It will be darkness and not light. Their judgment day will be a time of darkness. They had been sacrificing their children to false gods, bowing to inanimate idols carved by their own hands. Their judgment was imminent. It would be decisive, but not to their liking. <laughs> Verse 19. It will be as though a man fled from a lion and a bear met him. Or as though he went into the house, he thought he was safe, leaned his hand on the wall, and a serpent bit him. Amos points out that no matter what they do, they cannot escape. Nothing can stop what is coming. Things will go from bad to worse. Their fate is inescapable, unstoppable. Verse 20. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light? Is it not very dark with no brightness in it? God's love for all mankind is unconditional, but our redemption is conditioned on our repentance. So don't think once saved, always saved, because that will get you straight to hell. Our continuous salvation is dependent on our continuing righteousness and holy worship. If our change is only temporary, then our salvation is also only temporary. Hebrews 10, For if we sin willfully, knowingly, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. Amos erases even the faintest hope for this proud, unrepentant nation. He prophesies that the day of the Lord is all gloom and doom for Israel. God is not going to be dealing with their enemies at that time. He will be dealing with Israel themselves. It is their judgment that is coming. Is it not very dark? God will reuse the ninth plague of Egypt to display his displeasure. Exodus 10. I couldn't find a picture that showed dark that you could actually see, but hopefully you can see that. Exodus 10. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, Darkness which may even be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven, and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt, three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. But this time, Amos says, there will be no light in Israel. Religious rituals will not save. The northern kingdom had treated their worship 
from what God laid down in the law of Moses until their festivals and feasts were more fun, more boisterous occasions. So the final seven verses of this chapter revolve around the principle that rituals devoid of morality are simply empty gestures that God hates. Even today in California, we have our own rituals, and people go put on these uh, cloaks, worship, sacrifice children. If you want to get ahead in politics and in leadership today, this is what they demand of you. Verse 21, I hate, I despise your feast days, and I do not savor your sacred assemblies. I hate. The word hate appears three times in this chapter alone. In verse 10, they hate the one who rebukes. That's Amos sitting in the gate. Verse 15, hate evil and love good. And verse 21 over here, I hate, I despise. God can't state it any clearer than that. I despise your feast days. God's very clear that these are their feast days, not his. They have corrupted God's holy feasts and festivals with the depravity of paganism and fake devotion. And God despises the heresy of their priestcraft. They have no holiness in them, no righteousness. I do not savor your sacred assemblies. These false ceremonies and their incense are an abomination to a holy God. God despises these pagan rituals. God does not inhale the incense with delight. In fact, their stink offends him. Leviticus 26, I will destroy your high places, cut down your incense altars, and pile your dead bodies on the lifeless forms of your idols, and I will abhor you. God does not want rituals. He wants our fellowship. Our holy, heartfelt prayers are sweet, sweet aroma to God. Psalm 141, may my prayer be set before you like incense. 2 Corinthians 2, for we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved. Revelation 5, golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And a few chapters later, the smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of God's people, went up before God. So God's looking for our holy, heartfelt prayers. Verse 22, though you offer me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them, nor will I regard your fat and peace offerings. The burnt and grain offerings were mandatory for the atonement of sins. The peace offering is voluntary offering for thanksgiving. God will not accept any offerings, neither mandatory nor voluntary, because they are doing this within a pagan worship system. Even if Israel was sincere in their offerings, they were also sincerely wrong. Leviticus 26, I will turn your cities into ruins and lay waste your sanctuaries. And I will take no delight in the pleasing aroma of your offerings. All sacrifices were meant to be pleasing to God. Leviticus 1, it is a burnt offering, a food offering, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. Leviticus 2, the grain offering, and burn it on the altar as a food offering, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. But obedience to God supersedes all. 1 Samuel 15, so Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. Before Jesus, God allowed an innocent animal to be sacrificed for our sin. These Old Testament sacrifices were meant as a prelude to the holy sacrifice of Jesus, who laid down his life that we might be saved. We are saved by his death on the cross, by his innocent blood. Jesus is our sacrificial lamb. Hebrews 9, Jesus, he did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. There's power in the blood of Jesus. Our focus should always be on what he did for us to get us to heaven and not on what we are doing to get to heaven. Works won't get us eternal life. A relationship with God gets us eternal life. I will not accept them. God doesn't want empty gestures. He rejects them all. 
So, verse 23. Take away from me the noise of your songs, for I will not hear the melody of your stringed instruments, the noise of your songs. Amos switches now to the songs and music. The leaders have no love for their citizens, yet they sing false praises at religious festivals and feasts. To God, their songs are just a clanging noise, sheer hypocrisy. So this is the official Levites, this is the good guys, uh, singing praises to the Lord. 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. I will not hear the melody. The real question is, did God enjoy the praise and worship? Amos says, no. God is deaf to the melodies of their hearts. Verse 24. But let justice run down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. This is the remedy, a flood of justice and righteousness. These are prerequisites that God requires as laid down in the law of Moses for peaceful coexistence. But Israel has reviled and abandoned God's law. These critical components for peaceful community living are missing. Like water, a mighty stream. A mighty stream is in contrast to seasonal springs that are dry much of the year. The association is that where there is water, life flourishes. Where there is justice and righteousness, life also flourishes. Verse 25. Did you offer me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness 40 years, O house of Israel? God reminds Israel of their wilderness experience. During that time, sacrifices were not done exactly as prescribed because of their mobile circumstances as they roamed. And God didn't demand that they exactly obey his rituals then. Amos points out that Israel's relationship with God was never based on sacrifices and rituals. It was based on obedience to his word. Jeremiah 7, for when I brought your ancestors out of Egypt and spoke to them, I did not just give them commands about burnt offerings and sacrifices, but I gave them this command, obey me and I will be your God and you will be my people. Walk in obedience to all I command you, that it may go well with you. In the wilderness, 40 years. At Kadesh Barnea, Moses sent spies into Canaan to spy out the promised land, for which God said he would help them fight. When the spies returned, they said the land was wonderful, flowing with milk and honey. But the people were giants, and they were afraid and refused to fight. So God had them wander around in the wilderness for 40 years, as the fearful died off because of their lack of obedience. Excluding Moses and the priesthood, only two out of two million survived the wilderness. Two out of two million. This was Caleb and Joshua. All those that eventually fought for the promised land were born in the wilderness. None of those that originally left Egypt survived. Verse 26. You also carried Sakuth, your king, and Chion, your idols, a star of your gods, which you made for yourselves, which you made for yourselves. I mean, they make their own idols. Now God's complaint returns to their apostasy, specifically the astral deities that they worship. Ephraim had borrowed the pagan idols of their neighbors and dedicated them to Yehovah. Sukkoth and Kaiwan were interchangeable names for the Babylonian god Saturn. And Kayun is also associated with Moloch, the national god of the Ammonites, that demands children as sacrifices. And here this is the uh, star of Moloch, or Moloch, Moloch, the national god of the Ammonites, pagan god. And here is the fish mitre hat that they wear, uh, which is the Assyrian god of Dagon, the fish god. You'll learn all about that in my series on Jonah. So you become like the gods or the demons that you worship. They have become heartless, immoral, and apostate. Psalm 135, those who make them will be like them, and so will all who trust in them. The star of your gods. The ancient worshipped the planet Saturn instead of the creator of the universe. They were infected with Sabianism, the worship of Saber, the starry host, instead of worshipping Yahweh, the creator of the starry skies, which you made for yourselves. These are just carved idols that people created by whittling away at a piece of wood or smelting a shape in silver or gold, propping it up on a mantle and then bowing down to it. The inanity of this idolatry just blows my mind. Such utterly senseless behavior, pointless worship, 
I think groveling to something I just made is pure stupidity. If with my small mind I think this, imagine how Almighty Creator used this pathetic insanity. Verse 27. Therefore I will send you in captivity beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. Therefore I will send you in captivity. God's very clear about their fate because of their sins. He brought them out of slavery in Egypt, but now he is sending them back into slavery in Assyria, beyond Damascus. Damascus was the capital city of Aram, Syria. Beyond Syria is Assyria, which carried off the north in 722 BC. Their exile is final, from the promised land to a far foreign land, and the northern kingdom ceased to exist. They ceased to exist. Unbelievable. And the Assyrians carved it all in the walls. They would love to show them trotting all these people off into exile, tied to a rope with a string through their noses on the rope. Unbelievable. So this is the end of Episode 7, Chapter 5, A Lament for Israel. Thank you for sitting with me through the whole thing. Remember, 2 Chronicles 7.14, God said, If my people, which today is the church, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. So if you do those simple things, if you repent, mightily repent and change, then God will forgive your sin and heal your land. Isn't that beautiful? So let, before you go, let me bless you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. God bless you. God bless you. Shalom.